What's up, guys? So before you start pressing fast forward on that on that phone of yours or your computer, or whatever, it is, we wanted to let you guys know that we are going to be putting this podcast onto a jujitsu podcast YouTube channel. So we want to put the videos up there as well because uh, we've had people say that they um, they're like me because I actually have the YouTube Red subscription, so I can like like have videos going and stuff. So I actually watch a lot of lectures and things like that through the uh, through YouTube. So we're gonna have this up on a YouTube. Uh, channel, so uh, keep that in mind, and we would appreciate if you guys subscribe. What is going to be the YouTube channel name? The Jiu Jitsu Podcast. Uh, it's fitting. Pretty um, incredible. <laughs> creative. Yeah. If you yeah, it was really good, You're really creative. Really, yes. I-, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, just go subscribe to it, um, and again, you can check the podcast out there as well. Uh, today we got a uh, Dr. Steve Mora, who is an interesting guy. He's uh, Eugene found him because obviously Eugene's into that physical therapy space, you know, and, and looking at uh, surgeries because he works really closely with orthopedic surgeons and stuff. So it's something yeah. you're interested in. And uh, talking to him was it really interesting because I'm looking at it from, you know, the guy that doesn't know anything. I'm like probably one of you listening where I'm an idiot when it comes to how orthopedic surgeons work and what they do and everything else. And it was uh, it was a really interesting podcast to talk to him and learn more about this stuff. Like he got into like the differences of like stem cell therapies and even talking about some of them were kind of maybe mislabeled stem cell therapies back in the day, um, getting into things like meniscus tears and ACL tears and LCL tears, things that are really common. Or even like, I thought it was really interesting when he talked about the uh, the actual the longevity of a knee replacement. Like, mm-hmm. what can you, well, how can you train if you have a knee or hip replacement? So, some really good information. Uh, and he breaks it down in a nice, simple way, which, again, it's not going to be a, uh, um, a big, you don't have to pull out the dictionary to listen to it. So, hope you guys enjoy this one. As always, guys, one of our sponsors is Charlotte's Web. The uh, the CBD that Eugene and I use, we've uh, had them on, they've been a part of the show for, it's, it's been like a year and a half now? It's been a while. It's been a I while. Mean, we've been doing the show for, to almost two years, almost or two, a, little over two years? Two, a little over two years now. Wow. Yeah, and so again, they've uh, they've been. I think they were like our first like big sponsor. They got into it. I really like their products. Um, currently, I'm using the sleep gummies. Yes. And, man, I sleep like a rock, bro. I know. Like I, um, you know, again. It could be whatever, because I can't, you, you know, making claims about stuff is ridiculous, right? Because that's the thing about CBD. It's like one of those things where it's not regulated. There's so much ambiguity to what it does. All I know is that when I take it, I sleep like a rock. Dude, I have not slept. So I forgot to take it past couple nights. Uh-huh. Honestly, like I was uh, in, in bed and I kind of just Did forgot. Did you wake up early? I like, trailed off to sleep, right? But uh-huh. I didn't get a, I kept waking up. Yeah, like, yeah, I would keep waking up or not. I, I don't know. That's my, that's just the way I feel. Maybe like. I'm making it up or I, I don't know, but that's the way I felt. Like I didn't get as good a sleep. I didn't sleep as long and as restfully. That's just, that's just how it affects me. So I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, if you guys are interested, like, you know, and the reason why I always talk about sleep is because like people will go, all right, Chewy, like, I get messages all the time about this. Chewy, what's the best stuff for recovery? What's the best thing you can give for recovery? And like, I'm like sleep. Like it's your body's mechanism to recover itself and your body does it better yeah. than we can do it. Right. Like, so it, you know, like your body's a, a, a marvelous machine. Like you're going to listen to Dr. Moore talk about the way that the bones will literally weld themselves together automatically, like you, without you having to think or do anything about it. And so good sleep is huge. I mean, it's one of the most important things for recovery. And so, um, you know, that's why I always encourage people to, to try it out and see what you think. I usually take the CBD towards the end of the night, about maybe 30 minutes to an hour before. And I kind of go through a sleep ritual where I take a hot shower, I get out and I do a little bit of light stretching to kind of loosen up my muscles. It seems to help me out. And then after that, I have a, a, a dim light uh, next to my bed and I read. My phone mm-hmm. is turned off on airplane mode. It's sitting a, far away from the bed. And uh, I sit there and read. And I read um, whatever book I want to read. And I just kind of gently go off to sleep. And I sleep, you know, I'll, which I know it sounds weird. I, there was a time where I was like sleeping for maybe four or five hours and I'd wake up, have to use the restroom and all this stuff where now it's like I'm sleeping in a solid like seven, just out cold. Feel, yeah. Feel great. You know, I wake up the next morning, feel great. So again, anyway, guys, that said, check out their stuff. If you want to use promo code jujitsu, you'll save 15% on the order. And again, if I could recommend uh, one of the products, their tinctures are great. Um, their sleep gummies, I think are really good too. So check those out. Also guys, big thanks to our sponsor, Epic Roll. Uh, Matt's actually going to be in town soon. Yes, he's going to be on the podcast um, live in a month, and hopefully, he will be ready. He'll be there, and he'll be in the podcast room, the new one, yeah. not Grandma's table, 
cool ass table. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, it's gonna be a nice room. It's gonna be redone. I'm putting up the drywall right now. That's right. So we'll have that room ready, and um, when uh, when Matt's on, we'll be doing some videos with him and stuff like that. But uh, he's got a lot of cool gear. Let's bring this over here. He's got a hat which I put on the other day. Sure, he puts on. He looks good. Doesn't look good when you're not exactly on. a hat guy. You know, you know what the hat I wear? I wear like like the little cabby. Not is it the cabby hat. Or I don't whatever? know. What I, I don't, I'm not a hat guy. I don't. I have a long head, so I don't have. I don't have a good shape for hats. Uh, I've got a big, uh, big, big like, noggin, big, big long. Well, it's, it's just long. Like right? it's like my face is narrow and long. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, if you uh, if you guys want to check out someone that says I really like his shirts. It, it's like I, I'm fine with geese and I'm fine with all that stuff. But like finding cool shirts that are kind of just casual that, you know, again, it's like um, there's something about, like I said, I was talking about this before where some of the shirts that I wore when I was younger were like the super aggressive, I'm a jiu-jitsu guy, I identify with jiu-jitsu, look at me, how cool I am kind of shirts. Yeah. You know, like there was the the old shirt that said if you're, it was like a jiu-jitsu shirt on the front and then on the back said if you're scared, say you're scared. And then, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. I like his shirts where, you know, it's like, there's stuff in there where if you and a jiu-jitsu guy saw each other, you'd be like, oh, you do jiu-jitsu? But if it was like a, a person that doesn't, they they would they're like, what is this? I don't know Why what this is. Why is your ch- shirt talking about strangulation? Yeah. What is like, this? You wouldn't get it. You know, it's like you're, you kind of get to still be in the cool club. It's like back in the day. Remember when tap out was, was really like new? I remember if you, awesome. if you saw someone with with a tap out anything, I remember you would instantly say, oh, you, you train or you do something. I remember um, I bought some gear uh, my junior year of wrestling and then my, my senior year of wrestling, I remember um, we had like bags for all the starters, mm-hmm. like the wrestling bags, and I put this tap out sticker on my bag and I remember I was at a um, at a wrestling meet and this dude comes up to me with a tap out shirt on. He's like, you watch MMA? I was like, I do watch MMA. Who's your favorite fighter? We start talking, you know? So you're kind of in a club. So um, if you want to check out his stuff, epicrollbjj.com, promo code is ch- uh, jujitsu, 15% off on the order. And uh, again, guys, if you want to support the podcast directly, you can throw us a positive review. Five stars is nice on uh, iTunes or wherever the heck you listen to the podcast at. Because I, I feel like there's so many different apps. Like someone will say, "Chewy, is, is it on this app?" I'm, I'm like, "I think it's pretty much on everything. It's on everything." Yeah. Go listen to it there, and then <clears throat> you can also uh, get our Patreon, which is Patreon.com/slash The Jiu-Jitsu Podcast, where we have everything from clips with the guests. We have a full-length seminar there. There's a warm-up video that Eugene put together taking us through actual warm-ups that you could use to uh, warm your body up and loosen your body up before training. And um, I'm going to start sending out um, a live chat from time to time to the Patreon members. Yes. So if you guys are in the Patreon, you can jump in on those live chats. We typically do them on Sundays at uh, around 11.30 p or 11.30 a.m. <laughs> p.m. is past old Schuster's bedtime. Uh, 11, uh, 11.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. Mornings, uh, Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time or whatever the heck it's supposed to be. Because no, there will be, be a e- post in there that <clears throat> you can find it. Yeah, it used to be EST. Now it's like EDT, right? I don't know what that means. I, I don't know. East, I think Eastern. Is it about the farmers, Chewy? It's not about the farmers. Uh, so, yeah, check that out. <laughs> and for less than a quarter a day, you can get all that stuff that I just talked about. And honestly, the, um, the, the live hangouts that we've been doing have actually been a lot of fun because it's kind of small. So there's mm-hmm. not a ton of people. Um, and so it's like me and you know a group of people hanging out just chatting. I usually do kind of a um, a ramble of sorts in the beginning, and then afterwards I'm just talking with them, answering questions, and trying to helping them out with wherever they're at. Yeah. So if you guys want to jump in on that, join the Patreon. It's one of the ways you can do it, and uh, that's that. So with that said, guys, Doctor Steve Mora on the podcast. You're about to learn about some orthopedic surgery stuff. That's I make right. I make it sound so stupid. No, it's awesome. You're gonna, you're gonna. I don't have to add stuff to it. You're gonna about to learn about some orthopedic. You're about surgery. to learn today. You're about to learn today. Enjoy it. So we wanted to have you on to kind of maybe give people some good information that might might be useful to them. Great. Well, you know, uh, thank you so much, guys, for having me on here, uh, Eugene Chewy. Uh, appreciate. Uh, you know, the, your invitation. Uh, I am, um, you know, very interested in talking about uh, injuries, especially those that affect mixed martial artists. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I'll give you a little information about myself and a little background before we, we jump into those topics. Cool. Uh, first of all, I'm, you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, board certified orthopedic surgeon, and uh, I've been uh, uh, practicing for 18 years now in uh, Orange County. 
so for 18 years now, board certified orthopedic surgeon, I trained uh, LA County USC. That's where I did my orthopedic residency. And then I, then I did a sports medicine fellowship. A fellowship means that we take a, an, an extra year to refine and fine tune our skills in a particular uh, discipline. And mine is sports medicine, which basically means I focus on sports injuries, but mostly extremity type of injuries, uh, things that we see in, um, in MMA. Uh, I became interested in mixed martial arts. Actually, it was sort of an indirect type of way. I actually take care of a lot of police officers. I, I have a, um, an interest in taking care of our officers who, who help us. And I noticed that they suffer a lot of injuries uh, due to combat. You know, they uh, out in the street, you know, taking care of or, or during um, handling of suspects, they get injured, you know, whether they whether it's a fall off a curb or it's a, you know, trying to control somebody just like in MMA, you know, trying to control and then they get hurt controlling. So I started taking care of these, these uh, folks and, uh, and they just like naturally gravitated towards uh, MMA type injuries because they were very similar and vice versa. Uh, so my niche actually is taking care of MMA and police officer type of injuries because they're very similar. I used to be uh, a soccer injury doctor. I used to be uh, an assistant team doctor for uh, men's national soccer team. Um, that's a lot of ACL injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, I love soccer, but then, uh, but then I just naturally gravitated towards MMA because there was a greater need, especially in Orange County, uh, as uh, people started to gravitate towards that sport, especially the older athlete, someone like myself. You know, people that are, you know, 40 plus, 50. They're still doing it you know they they love doing it and then um, because i used to do some uh, boxing training myself at a gym in irvine uh, i met some trainers there that were in, in mma uh, and um and then they started to come see me because they saw me the doctor that's you know that's uh working his butt off and they kind of liked that i understood their sport so they started to see me and that's how I met people uh, like Rampage and some other guys who were trainers or who just happened to be in that gym. Mm -hmm. So then I, then, I, then I became interested in the sport and I, and I started to study the injury component and how they got injured. But more importantly, uh, um, I think what happened was I started to try to understand the culture uh, and their needs. And the needs of a professional MMA fighter are a little different than the uh, recreational MMA fighter because these guys, the professionals, uh, they use their sport to put food on their table, you know, to send their kids to college. Uh, and that means that they need to be treated in a way that allows them to get back into the ring uh, as close to 100% or greater uh, without losing time uh, from training. Because, um, you know, if they disappear, if they're, you know, if they're off the grid, they're off the grid. And that's not a good thing for, for a mixed martial artist. So that's my background. That's how I got interested in it. Uh, no, I don't, uh, I don't roll around on the mat. I, I don't do that. I actually suffered an injury myself when I was young. I was struck by a bus. It damaged my legs. So I can't really bend my knee very well. So it's very hard for me to, to, uh, to roll around on a mat. And I wouldn't want somebody to put a leg lock on me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that would end my career. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, that's my background and, and why I'm interested in this. Cool. I'm curious. Before we get into the injury stuff, I'm always fascinated by people and what drives them to get into things because obviously you've you know dedicated yourself into a profession of helping other people, um, you know, get healthy again and and continue to do what they're doing. What made you like when you were a young man coming up and you said, you know what, I'm going to do something. And sports medicine, doing this kind of thing, this career that you've chosen. Why did you choose that path? Do you know? Oh yeah, I I do know. Um, it's an extension of my own experience as a patient. Like I said, I was uh, run over by a bus when I was young, mangled extremities. Um, you know, I was very fortunate to have um, been treated by some great orthopedic surgeons. Uh, in, in, during that period, I've had numerous surgeries. I understand pain. I, I, I think it's really important to understand pain and, and understand not only how it affects you psychologically, but physically and, and understand it. It's like, a, it's, like, it's like wine, you know, there's different nuances and, and different bouquets. 
And pain is the same, and it's important to understand pain to be able to treat pain. So I, uh, so as a patient, I understand pain. I know the difference between arthritic pain, catching locking pain, instability pain, uh, pain that's not that bad, pain that's very worrisome. You know, I understand it because I've been through it. I understand uh, what people go through. Now, when I was a child going through this, uh, I was intrigued by orthopedic surgery because uh, for some reason I was intrigued by tools. I was intrigued by drills and saws and I would take things apart, put them back together again. I would take my fishing reels apart uh, and try to put them back together again. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I would take the engines apart, put them back together again. So I, I had a propensity to like to put things, to use my hands and my mind. Uh, so uh, I was, I was uh, in, intrigued by orthopedic surgery. So since I was five, probably, I knew that orthopedic surgery was a very interesting field. And, um, and, and I thought that it would be something that would fit my skill sets. Uh, and so I knew from five years of age, even though I fought it, I thought I wanted to be an artist for a while because I have some, I have good hands, I can draw. I fought it. I thought maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that. But then I just, I just kept going back to it, and uh, and my own person, you know, and, and I, and then I felt, you know what, my own personal experience is adding to to uh, to what I can do to help folks. And since I was helped to the point that it helped me. Uh, do what I do. I can walk. I mean, I was not able to walk. Um, you know, I had a short leg. I had a very, very short leg. My, I had a leg length discrepancy. I had a nine centimeter leg length discrepancy. So my, one of my legs was this much shorter than the other. Uh, one of my legs was going, uh, growing east, basically. So I had a deformity. I had osteotomies. I had leg lengthening. Like you won't meet too many people that have had leg lengthening. Mm. I'm one of these people. Uh, I've had numerous procedures that are very complex procedures. So I, it, so I knew a lot about orthopedic surgery even before I went into college. And then I, I just pursued it. And I thought I was going to be a traumatologist. The traumatologists are the guys that take care of the, you know, the, the, blunt, the, the for, forceful blunt trauma, high energy stuff. But then, um, you know, I thought, I don't really want to be in the hospital all day long. Um, even though that's what I went through, I was a trauma patient. So then my interest in sports kicked in. And I thought, you know what? I think uh, sports medicine is the way to go. And not, not only that, there's a whole different aspect of sports medicine that is the regenerative aspect, the, um, you know, the, the molecular component the, that was very intriguing. So it's more than just drills and miter saws and routers. And, uh, and, and there's a lot more to what I do than just that. And, and that's why I became interested in sports medicine because I like the, uh, the scientific part of it, the regenerative component. Mm. Uh, and, and that's what got me into medicine too, or into what I do. Yeah, I, I think there's a, you know, you're talking about being an artist. A lot of what you do is artistry. You have to be creative in some patients. It, you know, it's not always one technique doesn't always work. You have to think outside the box. You almost have to be an artist. You know, I, I've been in surgery with, with some orthopedic surgeons and doesn't always go as planned. Um, and so there's always some creativity involved. And uh, for, so definitely, I feel like all your life experiences, you know, have, you know, connected you to, to this career that you have. And I'm just curious, you know, for some people maybe that don't know, like how have you seen the type of surgeries evolve even now today with recovery as to when you were a young man or uh, going through surgeries and now seeing those same surgeries, how technology has evolved and allowed you to get people back faster? Um, I think, um, you know, our understanding of uh, how surgery affects people, how surgery uh, and immobilization, uh, how it can negatively impact recovery. So what's changed over time is uh, we use less casting. You know, we used to cast basically everything. You'd cast an MCL tear, you know. You cast it uh, probably an ACL tear. You, you cast it a lot of things in the old days. And, and um, I don't think I put on a cast in a long time. Uh, you know, we, we've develop tools and instruments and techniques to fix fractures or ligament tears in a way that allows what's called early mobilization because 
when you immobilize somebody, which sometimes it's necessary to immobilize, you bring in a, 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 another aspect to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to their problem, and that's uh, immobilization type of disease, atrophy, weakness, uh, you know, a lot of other issues. So the trend um, uh, has been over the last 20 years to uh, create techniques that allow for, uh, uh, for early, early mobilization, decrease the downtime, allow early movement, mm -hmm. uh, minimize trauma, minimize surgical trauma. That's actually a very important component. That means minimally invasive techniques that allow you to, to fix something without filleting something open. You know, so instrumentation has changed, uh, approaches have changed, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the philosophy has changed, uh, you know, uh, uh, life is movement, movement is life. You got to get people moving. Uh, I think that's the best way to kind of think about it. And that's how the tools and techniques and instruments have, have, uh, have changed because of that uh, mindset. And we don't want to have people just lying in bed with a body cast like I did. I had a body cast, lying in bed with a body cast. <laughs> like, it's awful. That's awful, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's awful. So like, for example, you get a femur fracture. Now we have rotting techniques, fix the femur rigidly. With a with a rod, you know, big diameter rod. Tomorrow they walk. Mm -hmm. Wow! You know, wow. in the old days, body cast or traction. So that's I think what's changed the most. And then of course we brought in biologics to to the game, where we can inject uh, platelet-rich plasma, uh, bone marrow concentrate into a repair site, uh, into a repair site to enhance uh, and improve healing and the quality of the the repair tissue. <laughs> So that's actually what's changing, still emerging, lots of questions still being asked, you know, what's the right dosing, what's the right amount, when's the right time, can we use these things, these uh, therapies, um, you know, uh, uh, without surgery, you know, those things have changed too. So there's still yeah. a lot of things to, to look forward to. Well, yeah, just just even like a hip replacement, for example, you know, you're seeing probably I'm sure of an anterior front approach where there's a minimal incision, a lot smaller, less tissue damage versus like when they go through the posterior, the back of the hip, where there's a lot more trauma to the joint or to the muscles around it. And so you get people up moving and they're out of the hospital within 23 hours. But they say they're, they're, you know, they're not yeah. overnight patients and they're up and walking like within as soon as they're able to, you know, come out of anesthesia. So it's just amazing, yeah. you know, as my, as a physical therapist, you know, what I've seen in evolution of that, you know, that that's a, a, a procedure that, you know, I don't even see in physical therapy anymore. A lot of these hip replacements, unless they have complications, we don't really treat them. They're, they're, you know, they're yeah. walking and they're kind of going about their business. And there's a lot of, you know, in MMA, we've seen, there are a lot of fighters or some fighters that have had hip replacements that still fight. Um, I think uh, one of Nogueras, I think had that, hmm. uh, he was, he had a hip issue. I think he had a replacement. So, um, but I'm, I'm curious though, just to get back to the grappling side of things. Um, what are the injuries that you saw a lot in, in the, um, in MMA fighters and also in, in the police officers, kind of what were those injuries and how did those injuries occur that kind of uh, were uh, similar? You know, they, um, they kind of have a, a commonality. It's basically, you know, someone uh, is trying to grab your arm and you're trying to pull it away. I mean, that's kind of one thing that happens, right? Someone's trying to control your, your, your hands. You're trying to pull away. So, uh, someone's trying to put you in an arm bar, you're trying to pull it away. And uh, when that happens, which is actually a common maneuver in, in MMA, uh, you can actually uh, rupture your biceps tendon because your muscle is, uh, pulls, pulls its own uh, tendon off the bone, mm -hmm. the strength of your own muscle, at, at, while someone is trying to pull your arm off, you know, and then you're trying to pull it back. Boom distal biceps tendon, distal biceps uh, uh, tear or avulsion. At the same time, same type of injury mechanism, pectoralis major, same thing. You know, you're pulling in like this, someone's pulling you out like this, you're stretching this area, pop, pec major rupture. Uh, very common. Uh, let's say they get you into the, an arm bar or something, they get it, they get there, and before you tap, subluxate your elbow. You just, you just subluxated your elbow, you know, you tore something, or even if it was a, even if it, even if nothing tore, you strained it. And if that happens over and over, 
you end up with a condition that I uh, coined called cauliflower elbow, which is a progressive degenerative process of the elbow that leads to spur formation, mm. tight anterior capsule, loss of extension, and loose bodies. Very common problem in MMA. You'll see some of these guys, they can't extend the elbow mm. fully. Mm. Uh, it, 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 it starts with a one, you know, with trauma first, and then you know, little minor micro traumas over time. And now they find it, they find that they can't extend their elbow. One of the biggest problems I see in MMA, extremely unique to MMA, the cauliflower elbow problem, which is basically an elbow that looks like uh, a 60 year old elbow. And there's a, there's a fix and not a lot of people know that there's a fix, but there's a fix. So, uh, tendon avulsions, uh, the cauliflower elbow, which is a degenerative elbow in a young person. Uh, and then you have, let's say you're, um, you're on the ground. Uh, and, uh, you're, uh, you know, you've got a, 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 a far guard or a distant guard. I don't, I don't remember the exact name of it. And someone, you know, you, the guy on the bottom has their legs wrapped around the guy on the top and the guy on the top pushes down, uh, the knee, uh, so that, so that they strain or tear their LCL, mm. very common injury, mm. uh, usually happens to the guy at the bottom. Uh, because of the the forceful push down on the knee, that's that's somewhat uh, somewhat locked in in a position. So lateral collateral ligament injury, I see it all the time. I've reconstructed numerous lateral collateral ligament injuries, uh, very unique to MMA. Uh, then of course you have you know your your garden variety meniscus tears, which is uh, which can happen in any sport just from overuse. Uh, just overuse or or a twisting injury, and then of course an ACL, which can happen to anybody just from misstepping. So those are, and then and then of course you have uh, blunt trauma contusions. I um, we used to call it the um, nightstick injury. Do you know what a nightstick injury is, Eugene? Or the forearm. Night, nightstick. Yeah, they fracture. Is it a fracture? Yeah, yeah. So in the old days, you know, when the baton Nature. came raining down on you, uh, bam. You, you fracture your ulna because you're protecting yourself. Very unique to MMA, protecting your head from the from the high kick. Bam, same thing. The kick uh, breaks your ulna. Mm. I mean, I've seen, I've I've operated on so many ulna fractures in pro MMA fighters. And one thing that I've learned uh, that's unique is uh, that you that with fighters because when they go back into the ring. And after sustaining an ulna fracture, what's unique is they expose themselves to to uh, 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 trauma once again to that el to that forearm, and oftentimes they refracture the ulna in a different area sure. adjacent sure. to the plate. So what I've learned the hard way is you got to get the plate out. That's unique to MMA, pro MMA fighters, especially the guys that 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 do a lot of uh, uh, you know spinning sort of punches and ground and pound uh the guys that have strong ground and pound game those guys are going to refracture their ulna and i've seen it many times i mean I, I, there's so many people that get ulna fractures and then refracture because the plate wasn't taken out mm. those are that's pretty much it for unique yeah. to mma that i see yeah so you were talking about meniscus uh injuries and obviously i'm between you two i'm kind of like the lay person here uh as far as the yeah um <laughs> in this kind of stuff but i'm curious um because I get probably one of the most common questions I get from people that are training and grappling is that they kind of tweak their meniscus in some fashion. Um, with you, with your experience with meniscus tears and things like that, like what's kind of the, is there a point where you can do something regenerative wise with it, like with some treatment, or is there a point where there simply is nothing left and you have to either repair it or shave it down or operate on it? It depends on the pattern. It depends on the rip of the tear pattern. So it's important to get an MRI to look at it uh, and try to define uh, the configuration of the tear. So there's certain tears uh, like um, uh, complex tears where basically it's torn and kind of shredded up, mm -hmm. uh, uh, shredded up into like little tiny little pieces. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Um, and yes, it'll be difficult to train initially, but you might be able to get through that without surgery especially if they have a little bit of age related or activity related degeneration. So that's one thing that's been changing over time is, you know, how uh, effective is shaving a meniscus tear when it's complex 
meaning a lot of little pieces, and when uh, there's a little bit of age-related arthritis. Uh, because if, they can, if you can get them through the storm uh, by um, uh, bracing therapy, activity modification, PRP for the degeneration, you might, they might be able to then get back to pretty close to baseline over time. That's, of course, with that particular pattern. If you have a, a, a tear where the, where, the, where the piece has flipped, maybe the meniscus has just like turned on itself uh, and it's not going back, uh, those are best treated by just trimming that little piece. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to do well over time probably. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have, uh, you know, other tears just to go back to the importance of looking at your MRI. You know, that's, why, that's what I mean by understanding the, the tear configuration. Mm -hmm. The surgeon uh, should look at the images and try to figure out the pattern because it, it can provide good prognostic information. So if, if someone's just looking at a paper that says posterior horn meniscus tear, uh, that doesn't mean anything to me. That literally means nothing. You got to look at the images and determine, are we talking about a complex tear? Are we talking about longitudinal tear? Are we talking about root tear? Uh, uh, are we talking about a flap tear, parrot beak tear? So much that can involve that area. So what I would say to your guys, Chewy, is this. Make sure that whoever is seeing you has looked at the images. And if they, and if they have no interest in looking at their images, then maybe they should get a second opinion. Because um, you got to look at the images. <laughs> you got to know what's going on. You got to know what you're dealing with. And so that's number one. Number two is uh, if it's something that's really out of place, then it may not be worth waiting too long and just going in and trying to do surgery. So then the next question is, what kind of surgery are we talking about? The, the trimming or repair? I do everything possible to preserve meniscus because meniscus is your shock absorber. Uh, and and if you if you remove it, even if you remove the little torn pieces, sometimes you remove a little bit of the, of the, the normal tissue to to, to uh, feather the edges. Uh, and uh, there there is information that shows, or sci scientific information that shows, uh, sometimes even with surgery, they might develop arthritis a little sooner than if they had not had surgery. So you gotta you know, so you want to repair as much as possible, repair when you can. So that means that the surgeon needs to be agile uh, uh, at repairing, you know, and not give up and try to repair if it looks like it's repairable. And as long as the patient knows, hey, look, repair doesn't mean automatic uh, uh, fix or automatic heal. Uh, it's, it means that they have to take a, they have to baby their leg a little bit, their knee to allow the healing to happen. So, you know, as far as meniscus tears go, they're not so easy to treat. Uh, you have to know what, what you're dealing with, uh, and and then if you if you if you do do surgery, you can uh, you need to make sure that you try to repair where you can, and if you can try to try to not do surgery, then maybe uh, regenerative injections can help. But they're mm -hmm. you know they're not they're not magic bullets to be mm -hmm. quite honest. Mm -hmm. They're not magic bullets. I mean they're good. Uh, uh, PRP or regenerative treatment is good when there's a little bit of degeneration. Is there certain injuries, um, and, and this might be a very broad question. Um, so we're talking about regenerative therapy. So you do um, stem cells, you do PRP, bone marrow, and then lipo lipogems. Is that correct? And I've really, I don't know a ton about that. The, the that's from the fat cells. But what have you found that works well? And for for maybe repair, even a meniscus, we can use that as an example. Um, yeah. What have you found works well for that? And uh, a big question is, you know, for preventative measures, is there any indication to like, say you don't really have, you just have kind of achy joints. You've been doing jujitsu for a while or training for a while. Is there an indication to say, Hey, let's just set up a, an annual, uh, you know, injection stem cells or whatever. Is there any benefit to that? Uh, not that, not that, uh, is not, not that it can be supported by science, but I'll tell you what can help. Uh, a maintenance program, a maintenance stretching program can help. Uh, making sure your weight is uh, ideal so that your body's not overloaded. Uh, you know, uh, I think a, a lot of problems happen due to overload or overstrain. So how do you uh, uh, decrease uh, strain? Well, if you stretch, 
your tissues are more pliable. It's kind of like a rubber band. You know, if a rubber band just sits there and you don't do anything, it's kind of rigid. But then if you kind of uh, stretch it a little bit, it's a little bit more stretchable. So same thing with our uh, our tissues are viscoelastic, so they kind of act, they can act like rubber bands. So if you're not if you're never stretching, you're rigid and le more likely to pop or to rip. So if you do a maintenance stretching program, um, which I think a lot of jiu-jitsu guys do actually, they, they seem to do they seem to be into stretching. Uh, but I think that uh, you know if you if you get stretched and you stretch routinely just as routine just as just like training uh then i think you can decrease injuries and um i mean most jiu-jitsu guys are, are their weight is is fine but you know as we as we get a little heavier it does put more weight on your joints so you have to if you manage that then you can avoid injury as well and interesting yeah and as far as like any you so say you said no really research as far as like you know, getting any kind of injections that just kind of for preventative measures that you've seen? Not that I've, none that I'm aware of as far as prophylactic regenerative injections. Uh, no, but uh, in terms of uh, what can be done whole body, you know, whole body, uh, make sure you're, uh, you know, as we get a little older, our, our hormones change. Uh, for guys, uh, sometimes uh, our testosterone goes down a little bit. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you're going to prevent injuries, but uh, as far as general health and vitality, uh, that's preventative, you know, being able to uh, optimize uh, your endocrine system. Uh, and, uh, but as far as injecting uh, something, nothing that I'm aware of at this moment. I mean, there are people that, uh, that take growth, you know, like to feel better. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, how, how much that's really helping people, mm -hmm. but, uh, for, you know, as far as routinely, maybe not the best, mm -hmm. I'd say that as far as in injectables and you know, things we can inject to decrease injuries, I can't really think of any right now off the top of my head, but you know, I think like the best thing in terms of, in terms of preventative is lifestyle stretching, core strengthening you know having a strong back lats traps uh, but uh, those things are all very important so if you're going to do if you're going to spend a little time instead of putting a you know putting a needle in you with a little deca uh <laughs> then just stretch you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah and so here's a question for you, because obviously, you know, it's become super popular and I'm sure you have some, uh, some interesting insights in it. Stem cells seem to be this, you know, some people say it's amazing and you see people doing it. What kind of uh, sort of results or maybe lack of results or your thoughts? Uh, what have you seen uh, with stem cells being used with people? Well, um, it depends what you mean by stem cells. Okay. okay. So there are people that uh, are going... And to um, you know other countries, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's Moon or Panama or wherever, and they're getting uh, intravenous uh, stem cells uh, that have been uh, harvested and have been um, expanded, meaning grown and multiplied. We don't grow and multiply stem cells in this country, so uh, those are stem cells from your own body. You know they do blood draws, and then they they uh, they're able to grow them and then they get them injected and we've all heard of people doing that i mean some pros have talked about it on podcasts and things like that um and oftentimes people are doing that uh kind of like for vitality feeling better um and or maybe they suffered an injury here they go to uh, panama or cancun and they get uh a, a a bolus of you know millions of stem cells of their own so maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. Um, I'm not really uh, sure, but people do say as far as empirical information, they feel better. Mm -hmm. um, now, as far as in this country, we, can, we, we, we get stem cells from our fat or we get stem cells from our bone marrow. And I think bone marrow has the most research and it's been used uh, mostly for, um, to, to augment healing, maybe after a surgery or to uh, augment healing of a tear that might heal. Mm -hmm. like, a, like maybe a small rotator cuff tear or we use it 
to uh, decrease pain from a degenerative problem like an arthritic knee. Mm -hmm. I think uh, bone marrow aspiration concentrate, BMAC. BMAC is what we do when we, you know, we take a bone marrow out of, uh, out of from the pelvis, concentrate uh, the stem cells along with the proteins and the platelets and we inject them. So BMAC, BMAC is probably uh, most often used right now. So, mm -hmm. so what I'm doing right now is I'm going through defining stem cells, you know, because there's more, uh, there's actually more. So BMAC is probably uh, the most legitimate and most proven, scientifically proven uh, stem cells that will help. Lipogems is just a, it's just a technique. Lipogems is a technique for harvesting stem cells from your fat. Mm -hmm. So um, when you harvest stem cells from your fat, uh, the FDA changed the rules a couple of years ago that uh, in order to procure those stem cells, you cannot use any substance to modify the fat cells. So we can't manipulate. So now we've changed the way we, we harvest stem cells from fat. We can, we can only uh, fragment them, you know, basically uh, kind of tear it apart, tear up the fat basically mm -hmm. into tiny little pieces. And, and then the stem cells are inside of it. So, or they're not, they're not you know, I, I don't think I can legally say stem cells to be quite honest. I think uh, we, you know, uh, we have to call them uh, uh, signaling cells, you know, doesn't have signal cells. <laughs> you can't say certain things the FDA does not allow us to say. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so now I'll tell you what happens, uh, what, what's been happening in the last uh, few years here. You're going to hear people that say, hey, I went down, down the street and I went to this clinic and they gave me stem cells. And then you ask them, well, where'd they get them from? Like bone marrow or your fat? No, no, no. It came in a vial. They, you know, they, 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 it came in a vial. Well, what was happening uh, or what has happened and it's uh, falling out of favor is uh, companies are able to uh, harvest uh, cells from umbilical cords, umbilical blood, umbilical tissue, um, uh, amniotic fluid, amniotic tissue, uh, Wharton's jelly. These are all birth products. You know, it's kind of like hot dogs. You know, when you go to, when you go to, uh, to a butcher, they throw away the, the parts of, that aren't the, the lean meat, they put it into a bucket and then they, they can make hot dogs ground beef out of it. Well, birth tissue is like that, you know? It's like, what are we gonna do with that stuff? Hey, let's uh, grind it up. Let's make, let's, uh, let's morselize it. It's gotta have something in it. Uh -huh. And it does, it actually does have uh, proteins and it does have cells, but you know, it comes down to processing, you know, the way they process it, freeze it, uh, freeze dry it. And then of course, how do you thaw it? Because if you, maybe there were stem cells, but then when you thaw it, <clears throat> they died. I mean, you know, uh, it's not like uh, when you, uh, when you save your, your, your kids umbilical blood in these banks, those places are, that's a whole different level of what they do. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're able to put uh, nutrients in, in the, you know, in, in the, in their to and they, they have protocols to thaw it and, 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 and they're able to then uh, get a lot of stem cells when they unthaw. But not what, we, not what we're talking about. These folks are selling little vials with frozen stuff and the doctor basically just shakes it, puts it in their hand, thaws it and sticks it into the joint. So what's been done is research has been showing in laboratories that when they, when they look at these tissues, these birth tissues, the, most cells are dead. Most oh, of the cells are dead. They're dead. They're just, the, the quality of the cells is, uh, is uh, worse than a PRP injection. So, you know, so people get, you know, been spending a lot of money on, on stem cells, which nowadays, because of the FDA, uh, everything's changed. And the folks that do sell these, uh, uh, these injectables, which by the way, probably have some properties that are helpful. Uh, there are proteins in it. They have hyaluronate, which is a, 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 a protein that can help, but they're not stem cells that are live, you know? So, even the salespeople have had to change uh, their song a little bit. Well, not a little bit. They can't say stem cells anymore. Isn't that amazing? They can't use the word stem cells anymore. So that just goes to show that there was a problem to begin with. You know? mm -hmm. And it's been uh, highlighted, which I think is good because I think the consumer needs to know. Now, are those products uh, 
not useful. Uh, no, they're useful for certain things, but but not as good as your own tissue. So that's why I asked you, what are we talking about when All people right. say stem cells? Because when you ask your uh, buddies or your friends who have had it, did they did they go to Panama to get expanded stem cells? Did they get their own stem cells, which are real from their own bone or fat, uh, preferably bone? Or did they get it from a vial? Because if they got it from a vial, then they probably didn't get live uh, cells. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so I wanted to kind of know, as far as like we, we had talked about meniscus tears or meniscus injuries, if somebody does have a surgery, um, what do you look at as far as, is there certain prerequisites you give them like when they can return to sport or maybe for any injury that you, that you deal with? What are some things like maybe some set guidelines that you have before you let somebody go back and start training again in their sport? It depends on what it is. You know, for ACLs, uh, it depends on the graft that's used. If it's an aloe or an auto, auto is your own, aloe is your borrowed, uh, from a cadaver. So uh, it depends uh, on that. If you're talking about ACLs, and then it, it, well, you know how this is, right? Single leg jump, you know, make sure they can uh, balance. Uh, I mean, there's things that you look at as well as time. And it's, it's a guideline that you know, Eugene. I mean, you're a you're a therapist. You kind of know how, mm. how uh, things work. I mean, they're not. I'm not going to let somebody get off crutches if they can't extend their knee. Then they're not going to walk properly. They're going to walk sure. with like a short leg gait, uh, even if it's six weeks from surgery. It's like you can't walk. Like, <laughs> you know. So I emphasize: get the knee straight. Work on those hamstrings. Now, as far as basic guidelines, the basic rule is this: if you do a meniscus repair. The basic rule that's been present basically, I mean, forever, six weeks of crutches. It's like basic rule, six weeks of crutches. Everything is like by six, six weeks of crutches or 12 weeks of crutches if it's some uh, reconstruction that needs a lot of support. Uh, those are, those are uh, the rough uh, rules or guidelines. Uh, I think that when I do repairs, if I do a meniscus repair, I do what I call a bulletproof repair or belts and suspenders. You know, I add more sutures than I need to, uh, or not that more sutures than I need to. I add more sutures so that I can tolerate me allowing the patient to walk sooner, mm -hmm. you know, as long as they can, they go through the rehab properly. So meniscus repair, I haven't had a, I, have, I haven't really had a problem telling a patient to wean themselves off crutches after three weeks. If I do, a, if, I, if I feel confident about the repair, meaning I do a rock solid repair of that meniscus where I do sutures, uh, what we call the outside in suture technique. Outside in suture technique is, is a way to tie down that meniscus so tight that it's almost impossible to break it free. So if I'm very confident about my repair, which I have to be, MMA fighters don't listen to me. When I tell them be on crutches, no way, they're not gonna be on crutches for three weeks. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen, man. I mean, look at Mike Bisbing right on his Instagram. He's uh, he's kicking a, a heavy bag with a knee replacement. Yep. Like, like, like three weeks from surgery. You know, it's like holy moly. I was like having a hernia when I saw that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, I'm like whoa, no. And then, uh, I mean, I have so many stories like that. They're not going to listen and mm. because they, they're confident about their, their body and their healing abilities. Yeah. Uh, because they are in good shape, right? If you're in good shape, you have good vascularity, good blood flow. Um, but so, uh, so what I know is if I'm going to fix these guys, bulletproof repair, man, which allows me to move them early. So the guidelines are, you know, usually six weeks, 12 weeks you know, uh, four months for ACL, six months, whatever. But I, I kind of base it on my repair uh, oftentimes. With the, um, with the knee surgery, like, like a knee replacement, what, uh, cause you know, I'm not sure it, it sounds, it sounds like it would be really, really, really rough. And maybe at one point it was, what is it like if, if say if a guy like a Michael Bisping gets his knee injury or his knee replacement done, um, obviously he's kicking the bag, maybe a little bit too early, but long term, um, what is his, what is it? What is the outlook for you? You thinking for him, what is the outlook that he can, you know, if he wants to go out and train a little bit, whether it be kickboxing or grappling or whatever, what is the likelihood uh, of what he can do or what his activity should look like long term? 
Well, you know, you have to think about uh, these uh, implants like car tires, okay? So um, you can have the, uh, you know, the best uh, uh, Pirellis, uh, you know, on your car, but if it's not aligned right, that thing's gonna wear out. I mean, that, that, that tire's gonna wear out in a, month, in a couple months. So uh, number one, it starts with technique and, and surgeon, surgeon technique, okay? It has to be put in perfect. The, 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 uh, the better aligned that it is, meaning the better it can distribute forces and weights and the weight of your body, then those forces are, are dispersed. So it leads to less wear because more of the joint uh, globally is, is doing the work. Now, if it's not aligned right, meaning it's off a little bit, a few degrees, it's gonna wear out, it's gonna wear out fast. So it starts with technique. Now, so what's the, what do you tell these guys? Uh, you say, look, it's like a car tire, man. Even if it's put in perfectly, if you go cross country, your tire's gonna wear out. Mm -hmm. So don't run, don't run. It's not a good idea to run. You know, the impact and the re repetitive nature of bending extending with impact and force is going to wear something out. So uh, uh, folks know that, we, we tell them that. Uh, and they know that they want their knee replacement to last, you know, a little kicking here and there is not a big deal. Grappling here and there is not a big deal. It, it should not affect uh, the longevity of the knee. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's uh, in terms of like, you know, if uh, talking to Mike specifically, I don't think there's a problem with grappling or with, uh, I wouldn't recommend kicking too hard. You know, I mean, I, you can, it's unlikely anything's going to happen. But you certainly don't want to kick a thousand times. You don't want to. Sure. You don't want to be like a K one guy. It's just like kicking and kicking <laughs> and kicking and kicking, right? Just nonstop a heavy bag. You know, it's not a good idea. That that micro motion, the micro motion that uh, that shaking mm. uh, can it can most likely impact uh, the cement bone interface. Mm. Probably like throw off the alignment or something. It, uh, no, it'll loosen it. It'll oh, yeah. actually loosen. It'll actually loosen it because it's actually glued on. If you look at my story that I did yesterday on Instagram, it, it's my story that I just did uh, on patellofemoral joint replacement, which I did yesterday. It might still be up. It shows a cement. So we use uh, a type of bone cement called methyl methacrylate, and that bone cement, you know, we push it into the bone, and then we put the implant on top. And then we compress and that bone cement becomes rock hard very fast, which you, I actually show how it becomes rock hard on, on the story. Okay. And um, it's very interesting, but it, it's that bone cement right at the border of the cement bone, it, the shaking, you know, the, the micro motion can lead to um, a loosening. So mm -hmm. you don't want to have a loose knee because if you have a loose, a loose joint replacement, it's like loose parts, you know, they, they're going to hurt. So that's what it is. It's not, you're not going to pull it out of alignment because alignment, it is what it is. The moment you put it in, the alignment's not going to change, but uh, you can certainly wear it out. I mean, you can loosen it. It's not the wear, you'll loosen it. And then you end up with uh, a painful knee, a painful swollen knee that needs to be redone. Mm. So I wouldn't uh, recommend uh, kicking a bag over and over and over and over. Uh, and I would not recommend uh, running unless you're running out of your house it's burning that's about it <laughs> yeah seriously <laughs> so, so prim primarily the impact the high impact stuff yeah the, the jarring. repetitive yeah Re repetitive, um, repetitive high impact yeah what, what about for the hips is, do you see any problems with kicking is, is it as bad for the for like a hip replacement do you think or is probably it not once again um you know you have to just think about the the loosening mm. uh, uh loosening issue yeah. uh you know, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, I don't know what the threshold is going to be. You know, what's the, the, do the, the dose that's going to lead to failure. Uh, but occasion occasional anything is probably okay. Hips, we used to be worried about dislocations, but like you spoke about, Eugene, the anterior approach, mm -hmm. usually people don't dislocate sure. uh, because of the, uh, the technology, the approach, the technique. Uh, so they're not going to dislocate most likely. Um, and, but loosening is still a possibility, but that takes years to happen. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and, you know, I think I kind of know the answer to this question, but like, what's, a, you know, what's the difficulty with working with professional fighters and these high level athletes? I think you kind of mentioned they maybe don't follow protocols or, um, you know, maybe you think the rules don't apply as much to them because they're such great athletes, in such great shape. What, what have you found that's been difficult to, to work with? Uh, and, and I found it too, because I'll tell people, you know, that, that I work with that are, have meniscus uh, surgeries. And I'm like, you're not quite ready. You don't have quite the, the stability, dynamic stability that you need, you know, for directional changes, you know, any kind of torsion could, you know, being unstable could, could cause a re-injury or, you know, set you back. So what have you found that's difficult with, with uh, these high-level athletes? I'll be honest, I haven't found anything difficult about them. Um, they are my favorite people to work with. They are healthy, uh, they're uh, conscientious about their health. Um, they, uh, they want to be better because they gotta put food on their table, the pros. Uh, but this, and and um, I, I know they're gonna not follow instructions. <laughs> I don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be a surprise if they, yeah. if they follow the questions. That's a surprise. Yeah. Um, and so, so then I have pressure. I have pressure to uh, do uh, do an, do a job that's going to tolerate that. Mm. Uh, I I know what I'm getting into. So uh, I know that I got to do uh, something that's um, that's going to uh, protect uh, protect the from themselves you know the, the repair has to be solid i do now when i'm serious about a problem like for example let's just pretend that a fighter smokes okay <laughs> whatever <Some> do. <laughs> i know you do man i mean we've seen it on the instagram pages right yeah. <laughs> um, i say hey look man smoking is the worst thing you can possibly do uh if you smoke your fracture is not going to heal it doesn't matter if I put uh, 12 screws into that bone and, and, and a rock solid plate and bone graft, it's not going to heal. So you're going to have a big problem. So you're going to have to just stop. And if it's uh, just start chewing Nicorette gum or, or start taking edibles, <laughs> don't, don't, put, don't, don't put smoke into your system. Stop smoking yeah. cigar, cigars or whatever. So um, those, are, but that's not, that's not uh, unique to fighters. You know, that's everybody. But I, honestly, I don't think, um, you know, they have, they may have some scheduling issues that, that put pressure on me. It's like, Hey doc, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm in camp and I have to fight, uh, in three weeks, you know, and I, uh, and I think I tore my meniscus or I think I tweaked my ACL. Um, I, you, you know, you, you want to say, I mean, you know what you got to say, right, Gene, you say, you got to slow down, man. You got to slow down a little bit. Uh, you're, you know, that's the only way you're going to get to heal. You can't say that to them. They're not going to drop out of, a, they're not going to drop out of a fight or some of them will, but some of them won't. Mm -hmm. So then you say, okay, then, then, then this is what we got to do, man. Uh, you get your, uh, your cardio workout. This is how you're going to do your cardio workout. Uh, let's inject PRP into the MCL because it's going to help it heal faster. Or we're going to inject PRP into your ankle. It'll help it heal faster. I don't think it's going to heal in three weeks, but it'll heal a little faster. Uh, we're going to protect it while you're training so it doesn't get any worse. Um, so, so I need to be creative in, in how I treat them so that they can do their, so they can do their job. It's not, uh, it, it's not terribly hard. Uh, it's hard for them. I mean, they're the ones that have it hard I and mean, they got to deal with this situation. You know, I feel, I feel for them. They're just trying to put food on their table and, you know, and be visible mm -hmm. and it's, and, you know, and dropping out of a fight, it's kind of a bad situation, man. I, I've, you know, I, I've seen fighters, you know, that having to make that decision, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's a real, like, like two weeks from surgery and it's a big multi-million dollar fight. And they really have a big problem where it's not just a PRP situation, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's sad. Mm -hmm. they're the ones that have it hard they, they have it hard I, I i don't have it hard working with them i just try to help help them get through their problem as uh and, and, and with the understanding of their culture sure when you were uh you you piqued my interest you were talking about the cement so i had to go look on your stories and look at it um it's always crazy to look at um 
the the stuff going on in the operating room, you know, because to like me, a lay person, it looks like like sterile sort of power tools. Cause it was like, you had a big giant caulking gun that you're mm-hmm. pulling yeah. it out there with, you know? Um, <laughs> but, but it was very cool. What, um, because obviously you post a lot of stuff in your fa- your, uh, your Instagram page. What made you decide, decide to do that? Cause I don't feel like there's a lot of, maybe there are, maybe I don't see them, but I don't feel like there's a ton of surgeons going, Hey, let come on in the operating room. With me. Let me show you this stuff. Like what made you decide to do that? Um, for me, I think it's my uh, challenge to educate people uh, about what they're getting into mm-hmm. and uh, not just, not just to show off my skills and say, Hey, look at me, but Hey, this is what you're going to get into. And the better you understand what you're going to get into, the better it is for me. People used to, uh, doctors used to say, Oh man, don't you hate it when people come in with Dr. Google information? I say, no, not at all. I don't hate it at all. The more people are informed, the better. It's it it's uh, it takes talent to explain something that's very complicated uh, in a way uh, that uh, that somebody will understand uh, in in a in the space of ten minutes, you mm-hmm. know, or fifteen minutes in the operating room. You know what I mean? So then I thought to myself, you know, this is a great tool, uh, and I learned from my own work on social media. I've been doing it for I've been doing social media, believe it or not, for 15 years. Okay. I got my first webpage in 2001, which is myorthodoc.com. I bought that webpage 18 years ago, myorthodoc.com. So I was, in, I was intrigued by, by uh, the internet. And you know, I built my own webpages, and then I started posting pictures. And then I realized, you know, pictures don't, don't, just, they don't do justice to what we're doing. And, and I think a lot of physicians and this is kind of like my corporate secret, you know, it's like, don't put pictures up of bloody things. Nobody wants to see <laughs> yucky, bloody things. Even when I take pictures, I, there are people that don't want to see blood they, they, in a serious way. They, they pass out, you know, it's yeah. a serious situation. Mm-hmm. And then who wants to see other p- p- persons suffering in blood? So I've learned uh, that a video, educational videos where I, uh, I uh, speak as though I'm speaking to the patient in front of me. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to, I, I, I know we all have uh, a, a medical language, but instead, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to osteotomize the bone now, I'll say, you know what, I'm going to take the saw and I'm going to saw, I'm going to cut the bone with the saw. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I'm going to cut it in a way to create a wedge, you know? So, so instead of saying, okay, I'm going to do a closing wedge osteotomy now, who's going to understand this stuff? You know, so, uh, so I've learned to, to I learned that, uh, you know, being able to describe something in a way that people can understand and I'm not, uh, being disrespectful to people. It's just, a, it's like Chinese. We speak Chinese in the operating room, you know, it's a different language. Yeah. So change, changing the language so people understand can be helpful for people that are going through something or that are going to go through something. And I'm not just putting these videos up there for the wow factor. Oh my God, look, you just cut the bone. It's honestly for educational purposes. It's all education. Meaning like even the story that you just saw, mm-hmm. uh, what, what's the, la- the last message I say is, if you've been told you need a knee replacement, ask your doctor, your yeah. surgeon, is a partial knee replacement an option? Because some physicians won't even mention it. Now, I'm not trying to give that person ammo you know to bother the doctor no it's just a legitimate question hey doc is a partial knee replacement will that work for me Mm -hmm. Uh, many people don't know that there's an option right and i also mentioned in that post it's not for everybody so i'm not trying to say it's for everybody yeah it's you know it depends on many factors many factors and uh, so i'm educating and i'm and i'm helping someone uh understand that joint replacement uh, is is not just one type of joint replacement, just referring back to that post. So my uh, motivation was really to add to what I do, which most pa- most physicians will tell you, we educate people. So this is just a natural extension of what I do, uh, educate through my videos, but I also do it in a way that's uh, respectful. Uh, I'm not uh, compromising anything. You know, uh, I, I try to be fast, even as I operate. I'm not, I don't tell people exactly how I do things. I do all the social media. Most of it is actually done by, by, by me. I do the editing, mm-hmm. but I do it on my off time. Like I might 
say to myself on Sunday, you know, I'm going to do a video on bone marrow aspiration, uh, concentrate stem cells. My next video will be, uh, I'm trying to, I always keep in my mind what I'm going to do. I think about my, my next project. I do a lot of stories, but my posts are, are actually few because I want them to have a, a, a uh, I want them to be effective at educating the person. I want to make sure I have diagrams, pictures, uh, the proper language, the right video, uh, the right perspective. Sure. So people know what am I doing here? You know, because if you just, a lot of docs show like these close ups of something being, being done, it's like, what is that thing? You, know, you don't know what's going on. So, uh, my, so for me, it's a challenge to create a post that's going to, have an impact an educational impact and that's really what motivates me it's like a, it's like a challenge and yes it helps me because people realize they listen to my voice they they uh, uh get an idea of my personality mm -hmm. they realize that i like to teach so then yes i benefit from it because people will say you know my doctor told me nothing <laughs> and uh, I, I, I want to know what's going on with my knee. I'm going to see Dr. Yeah. Mora. Yeah. So it, it helps me too. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I know that like you said, like Dr. Google, I had a funny situation when I was, uh, uh, I was 17. I, I tore my meniscus a little bit during a wrestling tournament and it was, you know, locking in place and it, it kind of, it, the symptoms kind of went away a little bit. And then eventually one day I was training about a year later when I was 18 years old or 19, excuse me. And, um, it got locked in place. I couldn't move. I couldn't fully extend my leg wow. anymore, you know? And I remember I went bad, to the doctor. Yeah. What's that? That's bad. Yeah. It wasn't good. It, it, it was painful and it hurt. And I went yeah. to the doctor and, and I went to the doctor and, you know, I, I had looked up a little bit because of the, the locking in place. And I said, uh, Hey doc, I think it could be maybe a meniscus. I don't know. You, you're, you know, <laughs> you know better. I told him, I was like, you know, better than me. I'm like, but this is what it was doing. It was locking in place. And that what, from what I read. Right. And the doctor's like, no, no, it's a, it's probably this. And he like gave me physical therapy. So I was doing PT for like, like two months. And I remember it was not getting any better. And, I, and for whatever reason, the doctor wouldn't order an MRI. So I went up to the, uh, the head PT. I was like, I'm done with this shit. I'm like, so I like going around, I was like, who's the head guy here? I'm like, I, I told the guy, cause I was like, I was working with the PTAs. So I was like, I think I have a torn meniscus. Would you just like mess around with my knee and see what you think? And he like does some stuff and he moves it around. And it was like, he, he said, talking about the, the, the locking and stuff. He's like, yeah, let's get you an MRI ordered. And sure enough, it was a, it was a torn meniscus, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's worth, like you said, kind of understanding how to explain it simply to people, but also being willing to, to listen as well. Yeah. And, uh, uh, did you have surgery? I, I did have surgery on that first one. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you had, I mean, you have, anytime you have locking, locking means something is out of place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, um, I mean, that's an automatic MRI. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've had guys at the gym with that, you know, they can't straighten their knee out and I'm like, look, and they tell me the mechanism of injury. What's that? Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, like they tell me the mechanism of injury. That's like you know a twisting. They're they're in a position where they're it's like a torsion, and then like the knees locked. I'm like, you you know it, it it's pretty much more than likely that's the case. And you're like, look, don't try to you know you need to go get it looked at, obviously, and, and because it, it may the meniscus may flip back into position. But more than likely, it's going to flip back out, and you're going to have more problems, and it's going to continue. But um, yeah, so that, that, that's an I don't know. It's it's interesting because they, obviously with insurance, as you know, insurance may not always they may want you to try some uh, physical therapy first. They always look at conservative measures. But again, in that case, when you can't straighten your knee, that's a problem. Yeah, of course. Well, your doctor needs to know the buzzwords, and, they, and most of us do. For example, if it's a uh, you know, certain insurance company that you know is going to be stubborn and difficult uh, at approving the MRI. Yeah. You got to yeah. use the the, uh, the right terminology. So uh, the terminology to get an MRI done uh, urgently is locked knee. There locked you go. Knee. There it is. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, a trauma, locked knee, swollen, can't walk. MRI. There's there no it is. about it, man. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> I'm going to tell people that. Um, That's it. That's it. That's awesome. all you got to do, man. You'll get the MRI. <laughs> uh, Dr. Moore, just, just wrapping up, you know, this is something that actually I'm curious about. 
Um, let's talk about ACLs for just a second, ACL injuries. And, and there's been some back and forth, like uh, as far as, yeah, I want to know your opinion on what do you feel like is the strongest repair? And it may not be the same for everyone, but for a grappler or an MMA fighter, you know, I've had some, some friends reach out and, and you know, the research is, they've gone to allografts and autographs. You've seen both, you know, what have you seen? What's an allograph and autograph? So either they use your own tissue, like okay. your hamstring or your like a tendon, mm. or they use a cadaver. So okay. uh, an, an allograft is like a cadaver. Um, I got to um, make sure we explain it for the yes, folks at yes, home that are, sure. that are like, you know, dumb yes. stuff like me. So <laughs> I, like we, I've had some friends, you know, from, uh, you know, that I've trained with and they've reached out and, and you've seen people like Dominic Cruz who's had multiple tears. Um, I don't know if all his repairs were the same. Um, what's your opinion on that? What's the best type of repair for wrestlers or grapplers? You know, um, I'm going to tell you that uh, ultimately it comes down to technique. Once again, uh, technique is very important. Uh, it has to be done right, whether you use an aloe, auto, ham, string, patella. What this means, chewy, just so you know, is uh, number one, you separate it into your own or someone or a cadaver, okay? So that's aloe versus auto. And then even within those categories, uh, there's subsets like um, your patella, your bone, your, your, you can borrow from your own patella tendon, okay? So that's called bone, patella tendon bone. If you look at my story today on Instagram, Steve Mora MD on Instagram, you, I actually show a beautiful, and I have to say beautifully placed, allograft into uh into the knee and that was a bone patella tendon bone allograft and basically what that means is that the graft has a little bone above and a little bone below attached to it uh in comparison to a all hamstring graft all hamstring is just one big long uh, rope of uh, rope like uh, tendon so uh, that's what people always say is like well, should I get this or should I get that? Well, you should actually, number one, is get a surgeon that is going to put it in right. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest about that and genuinely honest about this. Because if, you, if it's not put in right, it's like putting in, uh, 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 putting on a tire once again, you know, on your Audi and it's put in not balanced right and not aligned right. It's not going to work very well. It's, the tire is going to wear out, right? And it's not the rubber, it's not the maker's fault. It's actually the, the technician's fault. So the graft needs to be put in right. That means it has to be placed in a way that it doesn't get, uh, that it doesn't get encroached upon by the bone because then the bone will sort of rub it and damage it and tear it. Uh, the fixation has to be uh, well done, meaning uh, it has to be attached to the bone solidly uh, in some way. There's many ways to do it. Uh, and, um, and, then you have, and, um, and then, of course, later on, the rehab and all that. So what's the best? Uh, so once again, you got to make sure you go to uh, maybe per, in, a, a board certified sports medicine fellowship trained physician is a good start. And then as far as the, the graft type, well, I put in allografts in, uh, in fighters and they've been in for years and they're still professional, even kickboxers. So allograft, once again, it's, uh, it's the cadaver graft. And it, so it comes down to, once again, putting it in. Well, now, which one is scientifically, which one has been proven to be the best? Most likely, there's probably more scientific papers that support bone, patella tendon bone, auto, your own. Now, why is that? Because those little plugs of bone at the end of the graft, uh, they, uh, they heal into the bone because uh, it's the same substance as bone. So you put the bone into a hole, that bone, if it, just like a fracture, it's going to spot weld itself to its own type of tissue, bone. If you put in a hamstring graft into the tunnel, it may not spot weld itself the way bone would because it's not supposed to be there. So a hamstring graft might be uh, stronger on a machine. You know, like that's what sci the science shows that actually a hamstring graft is stronger like if you take it and go like this, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not stronger later on in time because it doesn't heal into the bone. Mm. Uh, okay, so when you mean by stronger, hamstring, a quadruple hamstring graft is probably stronger on a, on a machine in a lab, but a bone patella tendon bone auto in the end is most likely stronger in terms of clinical result. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if uh, so, if you're dealing with a graph work. So then the other question is, uh, if you do your own graft, you got to take it from your knee, which means there's an extra incision. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that extra incision in the front of your knee, sometimes it bothers people, yep. Yep. And especially a grappler. They're, they're on their knees sometimes, or a wrestler, you know? I mean, they, they, uh, an Olympic wrestler, you know? But, so you have to weigh the pros and cons. Okay, hey man, you're gonna have a little bit of knee pain when you go down on your knee, but it may be gone after a year. Um, so what I do is I tend to use bone patel tendon bone auto for certain cases. And, and but I tell them, look, uh, I'm going to make your incision just off, off the apex of your, of your knee. So that when you put your knee down, hopefully it'll hurt less the first year, but in the end, you're going to have a better result. Uh, now if it's a, a, a weekend grappler, like most of my friends, uh, you know, that go to the local gyms yeah, I'll yeah. Run out and they're 30 plus. I'll say, dude, just use an allograft, man. Use a bone patellin, bone patella tendon bone cadaver graft. I'll just use simple terms. Bone patella tendon bone cadaver graft. You get back to work sooner. Uh, you get back to the office, your work, physical therapist, whatever you do sooner, which means you can put food back on your table because we're not professional fighters. And, uh, and then it just takes, just wait a year before you get back on the, uh, before you get on the soccer field or the pitch or whatever you do, just wait about nine months. Just wait a little longer because your okay. cadaver graft might take a little longer to spot weld itself to the bone. So, so one more time, it depends on what you do. If you're a pro or not a pro, um, it depends on your age and what you do. So if you, uh, if you're like me, cadaver graft, no second thoughts. And if you're a professional athlete uh, who, and you want to have uh, the, the, a graft that heals the fastest and is the strong and as strong as clinically, your own bone patella tendon bone. Now, why would you use hamstring? Some doctors like hamstring. The incision is towards the back of the knee, but like I said, it's all soft tissue. It may not, it may not attach itself well to the bone because it's not meant to attach to the bone really. I mean, it's not, that's not where it came from. And, um, but it's a nice graft for, uh, for maybe the weekend warrior or a lady who doesn't want to have an incision in the front of the knee. Mm -hmm. that, that, makes sense. that makes sense. There is no easy answer. Right. Medicine right. is not so easy. That actually, that's a good message for me to mention right now. There is no one sentence answer uh, because we're all different. Every knee is different. Every human is different, uh, and uh, and that needs to be taken into consideration. So it would be wrong for me to say bone patella tendon bone, auto. It, it depends on your needs. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I've seen. Like a lot of the like maybe um, it's a stronger, like you said, the the using the patellar tendon is a little stronger, and uh, for a lot of jumpers, like people like maybe do some explosive movements as well. You know, it's kind of the way to go for like a basketball player, an athlete like that. Um, because it's your own tissue. It seems like there's, you know, there's, I guess there's less risk of maybe rejection of the tissue as well. It may heal a little stronger because it's your own tissue. I don't know if that's just, if that's what you've seen as well. It's not so much rejection. Uh, I actually have a post on my Instagram. It's uh, it's a, a picture of an allograft and, and uh, the title is, do they get rejected? Mm. There's some references on there. Um, we don't, we don't believe they get rejected. They're, uh, we, they, they, what happens with an allograft is patients don't have a lot of pain because there was no harvest. Gotcha. You know, there's no harvest. So they don't have a lot of pain. They feel better. And, and maybe they weren't uh, told, hey, man, it's going to take a little longer to heal. So don't be doing crazy stuff until maybe at least six months, okay? So uh, I think GSP came back after his ACL like a year later. You know, I think, I, I think, it, took, I think it took a long time. But people, which is probably smart, the longer you wait, the better. Uh, the, um, but what happens with an allograft, cadaver graft, is they'll, they'll, they'll fail. And people will say, oh, it got rejected, man. No, what happened was you just didn't wait long enough. Mm. Uh, or perhaps it wasn't put in just perfectly right. Yeah. So then yeah. It's the bone kind of uh, gnawed at it and damaged it. And then, and then, and then what happens was it tears all those little loose fibers in the bone in the knee, they sort of disappear. 
uh, you know, they just get just they just sort of disappear, you know. So people say, oh my God, it got rejected. But that happens even with a normal graph. Even the, I mean, once again, I keep referring to my story because actually what we're talking about is relevant to what I posted. When I do show the ACL today, I showed an ACL tear. It looks like it's, it, this is a, a person that had an ACL tear. I put the scope in. It looks like the graft, or not the graft, but their ligament is like disappearing almost. You know, it's like little, it's like a nubbin. I was able to unravel it, but it looks like it disappeared um, because it does get enzy enzymatically sort of eaten up. And that happens to any, any, any tissue, you know. So they don't really get rejected, but they can fail if you go, if you go at it too hard, too fast. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the last question I have for you, man, just because you were talking about, um, you know, again, technique and there is no such thing as a silver bullet. Um, but the technique of the surgeon obviously is, is, is most important. Are there any tips that you would recommend for someone if they're getting ready to have some sort of surgery or if something's messed up and they have to go see one? Um, do you have any tips for finding a good surgeon that, you know, that sort of thing? I don't know if there's an easy answer to that either, but if there's any tips, it might be useful to someone. Well, they can go um, to like uh, uh, a, uh, Anna, A A N A dot O R G. That's A A N A dot O R G. Anna is the uh, Association for Arthroscopists, uh, the, uh, the Arthroscopy Association of North America. That's what they are. Mm -hmm. And if you're part of Anna, which I am, most of the time you're a sports medicine fellowship trained guy. Okay. So if you're part of Anna, you're going to be on that roster and you might find a surgeon that's uh, uh that's part of that society which means uh they've dedicated extra time extra effort to uh to to doing the procedures we've talked about so technically they're probably uh, uh very good um of course if you have an acl tear you want to go to somebody that does a whole bunch of them it's like it's like when you have a bmw and and something fails you want to go to the bmw guy uh, you don't want to go to somebody else, right? Yeah. Before. yeah. So it's the same thing. If you have a, for example, um, I don't do hip replacements. Uh, why? Because my partner does a lot of them. Mm. And if, um, it, and if my family member came in and said, Hey Steve, or if a friend came, I'm not going to do this hip replacement. I'm going to let my, my, my partner do it. He does tons of them. Right. So he, he, he he's better at it. Basically. He's got the reps in so, on those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you need a hip replacement, you got to go see uh, the hip mechanic guy. If you have an ACL tear, see the ACL mechanic guy. If you have a meniscus tear, see the meniscus tear guy that knows how to save the meniscus and isn't going to just do a five minute surgery and whack it out and, uh, and go on to the next, next patient. So uh, you want to go to the person that does a whole bunch of what it is that you have. And it might, it takes a little uh, uh, doing. Oh, it makes sense. Very cool. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's almost like, you know, you guys have the orthopedic surgeons have specialties. It's almost like you have subspecialties in your specialty and like, you know, you, you do these specific things and like Chewy, like you said, you know, you could be a jujitsu guy that, or, you know, you have your reps. So like, if you get your reps in as for certain, certain technique, you're going to be better at it. Right. And like fighters. Absolutely, man. Fighters yeah, man. You, you, there's a rhythm, uh, a, a rhythm, an yeah. algorithm. And, uh, you know, when I do my ACLs, I mean, it's uh, 40 steps. I mean, it's like almost the same thing in terms of the steps. I mean, there's all, uh, it's not always the same, but I, I, I know, okay, now we do this. Now I bring my shaver in. Now sure. it's this. Now it's that. And my assistants know. So they, they know that it's pretty much going to be very similar. We always run into different things because patients are different. Um, they're, you know, their body's shaped different or whatever. But uh, we have it down to, uh, to we've done enough that, um, that we can make, that we can have a reliable, reproducible, good result every time or near every time. Of course, there's other variables, how the person heals, the th you know, the therapy or all that stuff, the biology. But for the most part, uh, reproducible uh, work is done by people that do a lot. Awesome. Just like you did too. You're exactly right, man. Yeah. Uh, Appreciate it. So, uh, Dr. Mora on Instagram, it's Steve Mora, MD, and then myorthodoc.com. Yeah, that's my website, awesome. which has a, 
additional information. And you know, I've actually been posting a lot of stuff on YouTube, which is just the same thing. My name, Steve Mora, MD. Uh, YouTube has longer videos, and but I do most of my work on on Instagram, uh, most of my educational stuff, and I try to put stories on there all the time. And I do, like I said, I I'll do a post every few weeks uh, that has um, you know good impact. But thank you yeah. so much, both hey, of you guys, you. Eugene. Thank you for uh, you know for hanging in there for your tenacity. I know it's hard for me to sit down. I'm really fortunate <laughs> that I had some time today. I'm glad that we did it today. It was actually a perfect day compared to other days. And, uh, and I appreciate you, uh, uh, bringing me on, on your, uh, uh, you know, on your podcast. I noticed that you had, you know, you have some of my, uh, some other people that I know on your podcast in the past, which is really, uh, really cool to see that as well. You know, you're bringing quality people, which is absolutely yeah. great. But once again, thank you so much guys. Thank you, Chewy. I hope, uh, everything goes well and make sure we take care of that knee. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. You st- you're in California, right? Stay safe out there yeah. as well. Yeah. I'm in uh, Southern California. I'm in orange. I have a practice called Restore Orthopedics and Spine Center. Uh, it's honestly probably the best practice that you'll ever walk into. You'll walk in, you'll say, wow, this is really nice. And the people are really nice. Our, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an environment that's supportive for our patients. Our staff members are great. We have eight physicians there. We, we have um, uh, two spine surgeons, interventional, interventional pain guys, which are really important to have because we've actually taken care of some MMA fighters that come in with pain and they just need certain types of well-placed injections. We have foot and ankle guy. We have, uh, and we have our joint guy, the guy who's telling you, uh, uh, Dr. Hassan, uh, Dr. Hassan, who's also on Instagram. I think he's OC joint replacement, uh, guy. Uh, our pain guy is, uh, uh Dr. Dramanovich. He's also on Instagram, but it's, but the practice is great. Come by, come by and visit. If you're in, where are you guys at? Kentucky. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's far. I remember in we're, the area. Hey, we're in we're in Louisville, actually. If you're wondering. Cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome, man. You know what? I'm glad that I know. Uh, but once again, thank you so much. Really appreciate you guys uh, bringing me uh, on. I appreciate okay. your time, Doctor Moore. Appreciate thank you. you. All right, man. You guys take, take care. care. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye bye. Thanks. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Um, again, that was a fun one for me. <laughs> I could probably pick that guy's brain because I'm thinking about like, hey, doc, my knee's a little achy. You know, what should I be doing for that? Because, you know, I, I know that from like the, that I probably I, I probably got the, the bargain basement doctor when I was like on my left knee when I was a kid <laughs> or my right knee because he, he was just like, let's just trim that stuff down. You know, that's what that's what they do, man. They, and it's like, a lot of docs do that. And um and sometimes it's necessary. It is. It is absolutely. Um, but man, ask questions. What, what I'll tell people honestly is like, ask questions. You know, have questions. If the doctor doesn't care to answer your questions, it might not be the right one for you. I'm not saying that bedside manner, like them interacting, is the most important thing because mm-hmm. some doctors are just that good and they don't have that good bedside manner with their well, patients. Sure. But they should be able to answer your questions if you have you know questions on options and stuff like that. That's your body too, mm-hmm. man. Somebody's cutting on you, so you gotta. Make sure you know what you're getting into. Yeah. So do your research before you, um, you know, you you have uh, any doctor uh, fillet you open, uh, you know. And I mean, it <laughs> really nice is, pick in there. Hey, man. I, I mean, around. when you look at like, if you go look at uh, Doctor Steve Morris like Instagram, I mean, obviously he's doing very like very precise work, and he's a he's a he's a trained you know master at what he's doing. But when you look at it, it looks like it looks like you're. It's a glorified power tools, dude. hundred percent. Like, like it's sterile. It's he's a glorified. You can think of him as like glorified carpenter. I mean, he's so good, but he's. You think of it that way. We also he talked about being an artist. He's he's an artist. Yeah. Because like well, it's I mean, artistic. Well, like well, a carpenter is an artist, man. Like the sure, way that like sure. I mean because it's this extension with your tools and your body that then you use your skill to create this thing. I mean I've uh, I remember my my mother uh, her, her one of her boyfriends was a carpenter mm. and I remember he could just make all kinds of really cool stuff out of wood. You know, yeah. he just just with his skill in his hand from these tools and he had an ex- he just like we have this uh, this feeling of of where the gi is, mm-hmm. right? And where our body is in space. He had a, a sixth sense about where his hands were with this tool in space, and he could just carve up stuff and move things around and do all kinds yeah. of really neat stuff. I, you know, I, I was reading, uh, there's a, a book called The Three Marriages. It's kind of, it's just about like balancing life, like, mm-hmm. your, your, like your career, your, your life, your marriage, kind of all those things. But he was talking about, in the book, he's talking about like um, a carpenter setting out his tools. Mm-hmm. 
and it was like such a meditative process such a kind of almost like a spiritual thing like just getting in everything prepared and, and so it, there is a lot of artistry to it the, the prep mm -hmm. and, and everything else that goes into you know even a surgeon because you can have two people have a similar surgery and totally different outcomes I mean, again there's a lot of variability you know in the individual but for the most part and a lot of times like he said it's about skill yeah it's about the artistry of, of the surgeon yeah, so hopefully you guys got some uh, good information from that uh, that podcast. I know that I enjoyed it, uh, and, and I learned a lot from it. So uh, with that said, guys, thanks for being here. And if you want to support the podcast, you can snag yourself some CBD from Charlotte's Web. Use the promo code JUJITSU, save 15% on the order. And if you want to check out some really cool jujitsu gear, I sound like so old, really cool. I'm gonna have my. Student. I don't know what is it hip. I don't know. My my, my my students are gonna start calling me like a boomer or something. What was the thing like? Uh, what's like a, a term that people use now that are that's like? Bro, I'm so old. Like I, is I, cool I, still I, the thing? I'm not old by by like old like age standards, but like I'm old at heart. You know? Yeah. Like I I'm I just tight. Remember if you used to say tight. Tight. That's Remember tight. raw. 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 Is raw. That's cold. That's cold. And cold. there's dope. That's, that's dope. dope. Maybe it's a, that's it. Off dope. the chains. I don't think was that, that was that something. I don't think there's an S. <laughs> it's off the chain. Too. Off the chains. Um, so I think it's dope. It's some dope gear. Oh my god! Such a geek. We are nerdy. I'm the I'm the I'm a geek. So if you guys want to get you some some cool jujitsu gear, check out uh, Matt's um, brand Epic Roll at epicrollbjj.com. Promo code is jujitsu. Save 15% on your order. I need to read this in a narrator voice. And then, um, again, if you guys want to support the podcast, either give us a rating on... Uh, the iTunes. On iTunes. Or wherever you listen to this podcast at. And if you'd like to join the Jiu-Jitsu Patreon, then go to www. <laughs> Patreon.com slash the Jiu Jitsu Podcast. Chewie's falling asleep. Over. <laughs> uh, I was about to say on the information superhighway. Oh, boy. Remember that one? I when, do. When we were kids, they were like, oh, boy. The internet, the information superhighway. Um, oh. Some young kids listen to me like, what's this boomer talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm not even a boomer. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, I'm having fun with you guys. I yes, usually, I, yes. at the end of the podcast, I usually have some fun. It's a late one. This is a late one for sure. It's like I'm, I'm almost like it's almost time for me to go to bed. Yeah, but I got two more meals to eat. Two more meals. Two do more it meals. up. So uh, that we got a YouTube channel. Um, we're posting the videos, we're clips, all kinds of stuff. Support that. Subscribe if you want to watch us actually in person or on video. Uh, talk to each other and guests. Yeah. So. so that's that. So thank you guys for being here today with us on this podcast, and we'll talk to you next week.